All right. Thank you so much for joining me today for our panel. This panel is on methane leak detection and emissions mitigation. My name is Erin Sutherland, and I'm with the Pipeline Safety Trust. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have questions that you want to uh, write in, you can email them into questions at pstrust.org, or we will have a Q&A at the end of this panel. So um, you can ask your question live as well. All right. I wanted to start out this panel by giving a bit of context on methane emissions. Um, as you guys know, methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. It has a global warming potential of, let's see, let me ch double check my notes, 27 to 30. So it's quite high. Um, 50 to 60 percent of methane emissions are the result of human activities. And in the U.S., the natural gas and petroleum systems are responsible for 50% uh, of it. Sorry, I advanced. Um, so you might be interested in knowing, you know, EPA reports that methane emissions are trending downward. Um, so you might be wondering why do we really care about mitigating emissions if EPA is saying they're, you know, we don't need to worry quite as much. Well, there's an obvious safety and health benefit for reducing our exposure to a, a highly flammable uh, gas. I'm not touching it. Sorry. Let's go back. And then obviously reducing our exposure to harmful chemicals. Good idea. There's also a near-term reduction. Near-term reductions uh, will mitigate extreme consequences of climate change. Uh, we know that methane emissions are the number one climate pr uh, pollutant right now, so we need to make sure that we're addressing that now as opposed to later. And there's also what we're going to talk about a little bit today is um, concerns about the accuracy of the reporting that EPA is receiving. Um, one recent study showed that emissions are actually 60 to 70 percent higher than what EPA has received in reporting data. So, you know, that's a pretty substantial uh, deviation from what, what we thought it was. We're also concerned about, you know, a smaller leak can over time, you know, result in lots and lots of emissions. So we want to address that problem. And really, this is low-hanging fruit. We know that fixing leaks from super emitters can get us a lot closer to meeting our climate goals, especially because, you know, as one study found, 16% of distribution leaks are responsible for 50% of emissions from this study. So we're talking quite a bit of emissions that need to be addressed. All right, so to put this into context with recent legislation, um, Section 113 of the Pipes Act um, requires FEMSA to develop standards for operators to use advanced leak detection systems to find and fix leaks. Uh, this is already effective. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the next one. <laughs> um, we anticipate a, a, a new rule to be published next year on this. Sorry, guys. It's very sensitive clicker. Or maybe it's not being touched at all and it's still advancing. All right, um, and in terms of what leak detection is, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, these, here's some visuals that kind of include some of the ideas associated with advanced leak detection technology. I just thought it would be helpful for you guys to see a little bit of what we might mean when we're talking about that. And then um, under section 114, uh, of the Pipes Act, pipeline and pipeline facility operators are required to mitigate their, minimize their methane releases. And this is new because before operators, as you know, are not required to address leaks unless they are going to cause uh, explosion, impact public safety, or cause property damage. So this means that operators really need to change how they're operating on a daily basis. This, uh, this one actually has gone, uh, ha there actually is a rule that's been drafted. It's been sent to OST. And if you're counting the 45 days from submission, that is later this month. So we'll see if it's released. Um, I thought that it would be nice to have a visual of some of the 
technology that might be used um, for what we're talking about under 114. This is a recompression station. Uh, thank you to Williams for this image. I thought that you might uh, find it interesting to see some of the technology at use. Sorry. Okay, so I wanted to start by introducing our panelists. We've got Mark Jebia. Would you mind introducing yourself, giving us a bit of information about why you're interested in the topic, and uh, pass it on to your next panelist? Sure thing. Um, hi, I'm Mark Jebia, Vice President of Environmental and Permitting for Williams. So um, in my role, I, I uh, really have oversight of our uh, environmental stewardship programs, which is everything from compliance at our operating facilities, uh, permitting for new, new projects and, and pipeline right-of-ways. Um, and a part of that is really a focus on methane emissions. So I've been with Williams for about 10 years, um, and we've been focused on how do we continue to reduce down and eliminate methane emissions across our footprint. So as, a, as an entity, we touch about 30% of the natural gas that moves from the wellheads to the burner tip across the country. And so we kind of in a really unique position to be able to, to implement some best practices and continue to reduce those emissions down. Max, can you go next? Yeah, Max Kiba, um, Program Development at FEMSA. My, my group kind of oversees policy, um, intersect of policy, data, um, and also technical. Uh, 114 programs, the inspection piece kind of came under one of my team members, but uh, our extended team members are certainly the inspectors of both uh, the regions and the states. Um, I, was also, I am currently still involved in the development of the 114 Best Available Technologies Report, which we are working to get out as soon as possible. Um, and then historically, um, back in 2012, there was a leak detection uh, study that I helped be part of, um, which some of the aspects from findings of that, including some of the more advanced uh, technologies, uh, we find that sometimes it is the landowner that's still finding it first. So uh, we might talk about that potentially in this session as well. Yeah. Thank you. Erin Murphy. Hi, I'm Erin Murphy. I'm a senior attorney with Environmental Defense Fund on our energy markets and utility regulation team. Um, I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I do a mix of state and federal engagement on the state level, engaging before public utility commissions around decarbonizing gas utilities, and then on the federal level, really focused on uh, mitigating methane emissions from pipelines before PHMSA and other agencies. Thank you. Joe? Hi. Hi. What do I do? Just touch it? Great. I don't know. I, yep. Oh, it is. Thank you. I thought it would light up. Um, I'm Joe Von Fischer. I'm a professor at Colorado State University. Uh, my favorite gas is methane. Uh, you may have different favorite gases, but um, that favoritism uh, has led me to study where methane comes from and how the atmosphere gets its greenhouse gas composition. I've worked with um, uh, developing and understanding a lot of different methodologies for finding methane sources, especially natural gas leaks. I've worked a lot, a lot in distribution systems um, and uh, worked, for example, with Environmental Defense Fund and Google to deploy high sensitivity methane, methane analyzers on Google Street View cars and uh, look at where natural gas leaks are coming from in cities. And so in that work, I've um, been part of what we call this advanced leak detection technology development, along with a growing number of people, including Paul. Paul? Yes, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. And uh, my name is Paul Weinert, uh, Executive Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer at Heath Consultants. And Heath Consultants is a company that started in 1933 um, in the leak detection business, believe it or not. We were doing leak detection back in 33 is how the company started. And so we are a service company and a product manufacturer of gas detection. I've been with them 42 years, um, started early out of college graduated State uh, University in New York at Syracuse, uh, environmental science and forestry degree. And so started walking pipelines earlier in my career, um, probably worked for every utility company in the US, transmission upstream at one point in time early in the career, um, walking pipelines and so uh, have background there. And then we've recently come up with a uh, advanced mobile leak detection technology, several different types. So we're active in portable equipment, fixed systems, mobile systems, satellite systems, drone systems, helicopter systems, plane fixed wing systems. So there's all types of different technology that hopefully we'll get in some discussion in this meeting. So. 
Thank you so much, panelists. Um, I'm happy to have you here. So, Joe, I want to start with you. Can you kick us off with some context on methane leaks generally and some of the work that you've done? Sure. I have my little card here and my bifocals <laughs> to read it with. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, thanks for asking me to do that. I, I think um, I'm really excited for the Pipes Act, um, and I'm thankful for what promise it offers, and I'm really thankful to Max and, and his group for their develop, work to develop the, um, the actual policy around that. Um, I think this ultimately stems from our desire to find natural gas leaks, and we, I think, have discovered that no two leaks are alike. Um, we can categorize them recognizing their differences um, from a safety perspective uh, for the risk to life and property, and maybe also from a climate safety perspective, looking at methane as a really potent greenhouse gas um, with 80 times the, the warming potential on a 20-year life, life, lifetime for methane. Um, there are a variety of ways we can categorize methane um, with regard to its detectability. And I think one thing to recognize is um, as you pointed out, Aaron, earlier, that uh, there is a disproportionate uh, amount of emissions that come from large leaks, despite their relative rarity. Um, so that in some types of the some parts of the natural gas system, as little as one or two percent of the leaks are causing um, eighty percent of the emissions. In other parts, it's maybe. 10 to 20 percent of the largest leaks that are causing the largest proportion of the emissions. So understanding what we think of as that frequency distribution or that histogram, what does it look like um, in different parts of the system? And, and especially paying attention to the fact that it has a long tail, meaning that it includes some very high emission rates that I think we, we, we need to be aware of when, as in our searching. Leaks don't um, emit all the time, um, and that some are ephemeral or some that appear to be ephemeral as a result of environmental conditions or operating status. Um, and they also differ in their sort of mechanical or physical context. Um, we could think of one context as being from the, the upstream and production end through midstream transmission and downstream distribution systems. But there are a variety of other mechanical contexts that are important for how we look for natural gas leaks. And finally, the environmental conditions around leaking natural gas points vary. And especially things like soil moisture and atmospheric conditions with winds are going to influence our probability of detection. And when we look at our overall suite of approaches to find natural gas leaks, it's this sort of context across these different categories of size, ephemeral, um, mechanical context, and environmental conditions that will define our success um, or probability of detection. It appears that you don't find every leak every time. And I think we have to start from that perspective, recognizing that we are, one, going to miss leaks, and two, um, that we can't count our leak surveys as a census. They are a survey. Um, the more you look, however, the more you find, in that um, the increased frequency um, will help us find more leaks, especially those that are ephemeral or those that are harder to find due to environmental conditions. And finally, the methodology we choose, that is what widget we're, we're using to look for leaks, um, the, who are the people and how are they trained and what are their motivational frameworks and how do we evaluate their success. And finally, what sort of analytical framework do we look at our results in? These factors will together determine our probability of finding leaks. And I think characterizing those probabilities is an important part of how we define success. And finally, I want to talk about reporting. I think that's come up a number of times today. And to me, it's one of the most important and maybe under-discussed parts. Reporting is learning. Um, and learning is uh, available to others to learn from the more we report. So learning. Um, uh, can happen when data is available to us and when we share it publicly. I think there's perhaps a shame that we feel when we report to some degree because we're talking about leaks as failures. If we think about leaks as something that, that we know happens and we can talk about the leaks that we find and share those results, there's an opportunity for others to improve based on our own finding. Finally, I think that uh, we can achieve better equity and justice in our society if we are reporting leak information on a spatial scale. There's a lot of pushback about uh, reporting about space. However, uh, for example, the US Census Bureau operates divisions called census tracts. And I would advocate that if we're reporting on the census tract scale about leak activity, about uh, um, activity due to pipeline safety, that it would allow us to track things um, without risking um, things that companies regard as sensitive in a spatial perspective. So that's what I wanted to offer as a background. Is that helpful, Aaron? Yes, thank you very much, Thank John. you for that chance. OK, I'm going to try to advance the slides backwards so we can talk about Section 113. 
Section 113 requires operators to find and fix leaks using advanced leak te detection technology. How are they to achieve this, and what is the type of technology that, pro that operators are using? Paul, do you think you can answer this one? Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> yes, I think, you know, leak detection technology has come a long way, you know, even in the last 10, 10 years um, from what was conventionally used, you know, particularly on downstream distribution. For years, everybody used a technology called flame ionization, FID technology. That was the common thread in the industry. It's pretty much what everybody used. Um, and since that time, things have changed. You know, there's a lot now with optical infrared technologies. There's a lot with laser-based tunable diode laser absorption spectroscopy technologies. There's different technologies with ring down cavity spectroscopy. You know, all some of these, these crazy words. But these are laboratory-type technology that's gotten much more sensitive, um, more selective, you know, to methane itself and not some of the other hydrocarbons, you know, in cities. And so people have evolved from FID, I'd say as a percentage out there, there's maybe probably less than 20% that still use that, that have moved over. So to me, that's advanced technology. You know, these technologies have advanced in what they previously used, you know, to do these inspections. Um, and a lot of them afford to do it faster, quicker, and cover more ground more rapidly, you know, and that's a lot of the key, you know, is what uh, um, Joe was talking about was that, you know, different leak surveys can produce different results. And so the idea is if you can, if you can survey pipe more often and more frequency, you will find more leaks because you've got changing environmental conditions as well along the way. So. Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak on this issue? Oh, yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was a really good overview. and. Um, yeah, when it comes to leak detection, I think that the technology really has advanced a long way. Um, and I want to distinguish between detection and quantification. The quantification of leaks is a little more uh, tricky. But it's amazing what we've seen happen in just the you – know, I've been with Williams in the uh, natural gas industry now for 10 years. And it's amazing to see how much technology has advanced in that time. And I think it's been really exciting both from the FEMSA perspective and EPA's perspective of really trying to drive – uh, rules and regulations that allow that continued advancement of that technology. Because I think we're going to see it um, continue to advance in the next couple of years. Okay. I just want to add a little bit. One, I think that um, with quantification comes uh, and detection, there are, there are elements of probability that come into this. And as a result, elements of statistics that I think are important. Um, and I don't think they have to be scary stats, nor does everyone in this room have to be an expert in statistics to a, a, a recognize the value of uncertainty. Um, we may not be able to find every leak, nor can we precisely identify the leak magnitude. It might be plus or minus 50%. It might be minus 60% to plus 200% in our uncertainty. But this is part of where we are, and we have to embrace that, and we have to get used to it, and we have to move forward and, and not wait for something that we think is perfect, and when that might actually be the environmental limit of our potential to uh, characterize leak magnitudes. We're going to have to move forward within that. Thank you. Aaron, did you want to say something? Yeah, maybe just to add a little bit onto this great discussion of, you know, what is advanced leak detection technology and what are sort of the options. I think it's it's really important to recognize that there isn't a one size fits all approach and there's a huge range of options out there and and what sort of works best is continuing to improve almost continuously as more um, technologies become commercially available. And, you know, what we see a lot when interacting with with operators and, and when doing field research is that um, there's, you know, often using a combination of methane detection technologies is the best solution. And so not just trying to pick a single technology and say, this is what we're going to apply across the board, but rather really thinking about how do we combine, you know, different um, leak survey frequencies with different technologies to make sure that we're covering the most ground possible, but also getting, you know, the best quantification possible to what Mark mentioned earlier is, is really valuable. And, you know, we're talking about leak detection under Section 113, which is really focused on finding and fixing leaks. But this does bring to mind for me sort of a, a related concept of, of methane quantification, where we often talk about, you know, the combination of bottom up and top down measurements is the best way to get a sense of what's happening on your system. Um, and I think certainly looking forward to, to see how advanced leak detection is defined by PHMSA and the forthcoming rule. Um, but certainly, you know, want to emphasize sort of the value of applying multiple technologies as well as work practices. Thank you. 
Um, so you spoke a bit about this in your question, but I am curious about, you know, does the type of leak tech leak detection technology vary substantially depending on what stage of transport the gas is in? Does leak detection during transmission look a lot different from distribution leak detection? And do transmission op operators have different costs compared to distribution? I'm really curious about this. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I can answer that. Um, if you look at downstream distribution, and I'm talking, you know, the, the neighborhoods you generally live in, you know, our wall-to-wall -wall concrete in many cases, concrete in downtown cities like here in New Orleans or New York City, you know, and so those are a little different too. And you've got canopies, tree canopies, you've got overhangs of homes and houses over meters and things of that sort. So there's not as much um, aerial type inspections in those type. Most of them are on foot patrol and or vehicle, where vehicles will drive the city streets of different types of technology. And some of the advance now is the ability of not doing it in parts per million anymore, like conventionally, but in parts per billion to give you a much more sensitivity or in a bigger range. Now, if I take that technology out on a transmission line, transmission, you have, you know, cut right of ways, canopies generally trimmed and things of that sort. And so you, you can do inspections with helicopters with leak detection technology. You can use drones, you can use fixed wing helicopters or even work in satellite technology now because you have line of sight. Um, that you don't have in a city type system that makes it more difficult. And now some of that's being applied to the, um, the E&P side, the upstream on the environmental production. You know, we've all heard these orphan and abandoned wells now and trying to locate and find these. A lot of these are being done by aerial technologies as well. So there are different, different technologies for different applications for different, whether you're upstream, midstream or downstream. Great. Well, I'll I was going to add one more thing, and that is that um, it, uh, there are emerging technologies. There are, I would argue, proven technologies that exist at each of the, uh, the scales where we're working. Um, there are improvements in those existing technologies that are genuine improvement. And um, I, I am always thankful when I go to the grocery store and I can look at the nutrition information on a box of cereal or whatever I buy. But I think it, we're in a, entering a, a stage that I hope is short-lived where nutrition information on some of the advanced leak detection providers is a little bit short to lacking. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can identify mechanisms through which we can evaluate things like detection limits and detection probabilities so that we're not overselling things like the potential for satellite information to uh, help us find um, the small leaks and distribution systems that we might uh, hope for. Uh, a satellite is a wonderful concept, uh, but our ability to see things from space is, is functionally limited by physics. Uh, scientists might have a pretty good idea of what those limits are, and I think um, we're asking a lot of utility operators to become scientists in order to evaluate some of the offerings that are out there. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's a really interesting question because it, it, it is, uh, my favorite answer as an environmental professional is, it depends. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many factors that come into play. I think uh, the GTI, uh, the, the Collaboratory for Advancing Methane Science, the CAMS team, uh, published a white paper on satellite technology. And uh, if you think you kind of remotely understand some things, read one of those white papers. It's, uh, it's unbelievable how, many, how much it goes into uh, the ability of some of these technologies to truly detect and quantify. Um, but yeah, it's... As you think through the natural gas value chain, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, discussion. You know, what we just mentioned on local distribution, usually it's a single company operating those assets in, in a fixed geographic space. But then in that situation, you do have the, the concrete jungle, the overhangs of houses. Um, and then as you go farther upstream, it becomes also geographically limited, but then multiple operators in the same space. So it begins to lend towards... Uh, array concepts or even coalitions across industry or partnerships with government to cost effectively uh, to provide the monitoring services. So I think as this, this continues to develop uh, out as we move forward and, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's not a single regulatory agency. You know, a lot of agencies have involvement in this advanced leak detection space. So it definitely is going to be a, a really interesting collaborative uh, space to be in in the next couple of years. Thank you. I'm really interested to hear from FEMSA what you can say about what um, they're thinking on ALD, what uh, are allowable methods, um, what isn't ALD. 
Are there going to be performance standards or other requirements? What, what can you tell us? Can you give us any preview on your thinking? Well, um, <laughs> if you weren't in a CO2 rulemaking, um, if, since it is asking about a rule, we are limited to ex parte. We can't tell you what's in the rule. Um, I think it's fair to say uh, publicly, we've, we've taken some measures in our special permits, which these are all publicly, uh, but we've had some conditions on things like um, using leak detection equipment versus relying so much on, if anyone doesn't know, uh, a lot of odorant is used on distribution, and I agree with all the statements that have made on transmission versus distribution, putting my technical hat on. Um, usually it's some percentage of flow over time that you're looking for. So as the pressure drops more and more, usually the distribution and some transmission operators do put odorant in it, particularly if you're getting to more populated areas. But then questions come up, you know, after an incident, a um, member of the public says, oh yeah, I called in the odor, uh, called in the odor, company says they didn't get it, what's the question, things like that. Um, this is also in public domain, but um, our colleagues from NTSB uh, give us some recommendations on some of these incidents on things like in-home in -home methane detectors. Should we start using that equipment versus, again, relying so much on odorant? Um, <clears throat> there is an issue sometimes relying too much on technology. I mentioned, um, you know, one of our 2012 studies that, you know, everyone wants to do everything through um, computational pipeline monitoring, mm -hmm. which you can do it liquid and certain gas, but... We had a number of uh, what well, we found in that, that that study that even if you have this supposedly most 24/7 robust technology, it's still landowners that are finding those leaks first. Um, so those aspects, I will say, um, an angle we're looking at is trying to shift the paradigm. And again, this is in special permits as well, but um, changing that dynamic from managing uh, leaks to actually fixing leaks. So if anyone doesn't know, there's a grading system out there in um, uh, GPTC has uh, guidance out there. You know, grade one is typically your, your Im imminent hazard. Usually no one plays games with those. But then others are like scheduled leaks, it gives you some time. And then others are like the grade threes, which are lowest level that just keeps them going for a while. And essentially that's a managing leak program. What we're trying to encourage the thought is let's shift that to actually fixing those leaks and figuring out so you don't just keep on the books but get to the point of actually uh, fixing them as well. So um, again, publicly, um, and if anyone wants, we can send you some examples of at least what we're uh, having in special permits, but things like, uh, again, surveying, improving that, uh, the whole process. Uh, Aaron brought up a little bit about the methane reduction, which is a little more 114, but also do they have a process on at least looking what's out there. Um, and kind of in the methane reduction side, we are seeing, um, at least in our 114 inspection so far, we do see a number of operators are using the voluntary programs that are already out there through EPA and others. Um, may or not be a complete slam dunk for meeting 114 and, and possibly these, but again, that's I know some tools in a toolbox that operators are using. Um, the other one thing I will mention about rulemaking, which um, I don't know if it was touched on the last session, um, at the end of the day, some costs do come into this, and, and sometimes we are limited in, in having a cost-benefit analysis on some of these as well. So we're going to have to figure out what's the right approach of what's the paradigm shift versus others, because um, you know some people have meant we can't endorse or recommend specific technologies. So it gets challenging sometimes we get into rulemaking status in general of cost-benefit analyses. You know, we'd love to say we'd love to require these operators to use X, Y, and Z technologies, but when you apply it across the board for the entire industry, um, Anything's technically possible. Rick Kuperwitz has said it's not rocket science, so anything's technically possible. But when you get to, is it operationally feasible? Is it economically feasible? And those kind of, that's where the discussion gets a little more interesting. So, um, but we're trying to figure out how we, you know, again, advance safety, but we still have to follow the cost benefit um, rules we have in place. Thank you. Any responses or questions? <clears throat> no, I thought the Max did a good job there, and and you know, as mentioned of the great. <clears throat> the grade three leaks and, and repairing those. And, and most states and most utilities within those states have got very aggressive and in, in some of them have codes that you can't carry grade three leaks for more than two years or more than three years. And so there's a more aggressive pipe replacement program because most of those were on cast iron, some of the older legacy plastic type. And so there's a, aggressive replacement programs to replace a lot of that pipe and eliminate those. Um, not just from, and these are non-hazardous leaks from a safety standpoint, but obviously from an environmental, um, they're still leaking gas to the atmosphere. So, so a lot of that's being, being resolved, and so th that's a good thing. And then there's a lot of other utilities that have gone, they used to have to have an inspection on the downstream side, you know, once every three years. Business districts where they had to survey them, leak survey them, you know, once a year. 
um, for your bare steel or unprotected pipe, uncathodically protected was every three years, and then your plastics are cathodically protected every five. And so a lot of people have gone to three-year programs. So they're a lot more aggressive. They cover their system a lot more frequently, which is a good thing, you know, from an inspection-wise. And then now with advanced mobile technology and some of these technologies, they're even doing more surveys on top of compliance surveys for super emitter type things or continual inspections. So there's a lot more activity going on in the leak space um, that ever was done previously. So, Yeah, maybe just building on that discussion, I think Max mentioned um, you know, the grading system and Paul was just speaking to it as well. I want to maybe make a broader comment on, you know, as we're talking about how leaks are sort of managed and regulated, which is, I think what we're all getting at here and, and what's pretty widely recognized is that there's a real need for, for a paradigm shift in the way that we think about managing leaks on gas pipelines. Historically, this regulatory framework was designed around the idea that leaks on gas pipelines need to be managed from, from the perspective of, of safety incidents and explosions and ruptures. And that remains essential, right, and, and must continue. But there's now this recognition that any leak that's releasing methane consistently from a pipeline is contributing to, to climate change and is something that we need to address from essentially an air pollution perspective, right? And that's new in some ways as, as methane has become more widely recognized as, as such a potent greenhouse gas. But it's also really intrinsic for PHMSA, I think, as an agency whose mission includes protection of the environment and who sets you know minimum pipeline safety standards that consider protection of the environment. So so as we think about, you know, the Section 113 rulemaking, I, I also just, you know, I'm thinking more broadly that that this is about sort of updating the way that leaks are managed and addressed to recognize that any enduring leak on a pipeline is, you know, releasing something that's that's problematic for the environment and, and that needs to be found, fixed and, and addressed um, as quickly as possible. And, and I think we're we're getting there. Right. But normalizing that um, across the industry is is so essential. And, and that's why I think this nationwide rulemaking is, is really important. Thank you. I have one more question on 113, then we'll move on to section 114. I'm curious uh, to hear FEMSA's perspective and maybe a little from Joe about how should we prioritize leaks? Um, should we prioritize super emitters? Should we go after every single leak? I'm really curious what your thoughts are on this. Hmm. That's a good question because, you know, from an environmental perspective, you could argue, yeah, we should go after those super emitters because that's what's um, emitting the most into the atmosphere, but we do still, we're a safety focused mission, uh, mission safety focus. So certainly prioritizing based on risk is also important as well. So, but again, I think shifting that paradigm shift, particularly, um, you know, some of the distribution. Yeah. When you look at the stats, distribution probably doesn't have as much leakage as others. Um, but there are things like uh, uh, leak prone pipe and things like that, which we're addressing in other measures like the um, uh, bipart uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, the bill grant uh, that's mentioned out there. So a lot of uh, municipals uh, are taking a certain advantage of that and a lot of interest in it, by the way, um, which, uh, you know, thanks to Congress for giving us funding behind it. But we're finding um, the project needs are even much more than what we were originally given. But it's a good process as well to help that as well. So um, I think it is a balance of, you know, maybe the super emitters, but also, again, still focusing um, on risk uh, as well. But I, I agree, again, fully with Aaron, too. It, it does require a paradigm shift. I know there are some smaller operators out there, municipals, that they just, they don't want to deal with leaks, period. So they just, they fix them all. I also know it's a resource issue. So larger companies, it is it is a resource issue on, can you really get after all of them without um, affecting uh, resources from another program? So um, I think a little bit of both um, would be helpful, but um, you know, it's just some initial thoughts. Thank you. I have a couple thoughts. Um, uh, two, really. So one is, in general, I'm in favor of starting with a super emitter program. I think it makes sense that we should be targeting um, the largest leaks for and most immediate repair. Um, the second, uh, but related to that, is, is this concern that um, that it's easy to say, oh, why, why are we worried about distribution system when upstream is where the most leaks are? You know, why are we worried about natural gas when cows are doing this or rice? Why are we worried about the United States when China has all these emissions? So it's easy to fall into a logical fallacy where it's not my fault because someone else is worse. 
Um, and so when we have to like look at the valve in front of us, turn that valve down, and within the things that are under our direct control, focusing on super emitters makes sense. But let's not let the scope of super emitter um, allow us to not worry about the things that, are, that we are in direct control of. So that's one thought. The second one is as these ALD technologies come online, I think it's more likely that we're going to find um, uh, methane from natural gas sources that are not one of our traditional scopes, that is not upstream, midstream, downstream, but I think we're going to see a lot more post-consumer gas that we're going to be start observing. And one of the questions that then faces us is, what do we do about that? Um, and I think, once again, it's going to be easy for a lot of groups to say, not my problem because it's not my gas, because I have my own list of things to worry about. And I'd like to start thinking about that a little bit preemptively to say, well, if a distribution company is selling gas to a home or business and a significant amount of the gas is leaving that home or business, the utility is likely the one who's best able to identify that there exists a problem and to at least inform that operator that they may be able to do something about it. So I want to just expand the scope of what we're thinking a little bit to include some of those post meter sources. Thank you. Let's move on to 114. As you guys know, we've got a under this, we've got to minimize our methane releases. I'm curious, you know, it's reached its effective date. What are operators doing now to mitigate their vented emissions outside of just creating these plans? Who wants to answer? <laughs> I guess as the operator up here, I should probably answer that one. Um, so with, with Williams, what, what we did was, um, I, I guess about geez, it's maybe three years ago now, we made a climate commitment. And uh, the climate commitment was really focused on kind of the near term. So a 2030 goal of reducing our emissions by 56%. A big part of getting there is focusing in on our methane footprint. Uh, we kind of view our methane emissions as something that really can be controlled uh, mainly from day-to-day -day operations. Whereas some of the more broader kind of scope one and scope two emissions issues are a little more uh, capital intensive or projects it kind of gets gets a little bit beyond our frontline employees um, So not only did we make a climate commitment, but this year we made it a part of our all-employee bonus program to reduce methane emissions uh, Over the previous three-year average. So really it by doing that it's created a lot of uh, energy across our company around really getting those people that are closest to our our valves and our pipes to be focusing in on how do we reduce emissions and so when we looked at our footprint, um, you know, probably over the last four or five years, the category that's consistently the highest was blowdowns. And you know, we operate uh, large 42-inch diameter pipelines that are operating at you know, 1,000 PSI. So there's a lot of gas in that pipe. So if you go and blow that down at pipeline pressure, it's a pretty large source of methane emissions. So kind of as uh, what started as an experiment to see how it would impact the culture, we put in place in our in our uh, operating procedures, we said if, if it's going to be a million cubic feet of gas in that blowdown, you're required to, to recompress it, basically reduce the pressure by 80%. Um, and if not, like all other operating procedures we have in our management system, you have to get a vice president approval to vary from that. Uh, one good thing about culture is no one wants to go and ask their vice president for approval to deviate from an operating procedure. So we saw a lot of creativity in just how do we plan ahead communicate across all of our, our areas to be able to recompress these. And what was interesting is even though we set that a threshold at a million cubic feet, because that was, when we looked at our data, you know, it was kind of that same 80-20 rule, like 20% of our blowdowns were making up 80% of our emissions. And that million cubic feet was about a good threshold for those top emitters. Uh, we actually saw the, the culture of the company move towards always recompressing regardless of size of that blowdown. So it's been a really interesting uh, experiment. We're now kind of formalizing that into our, our company-wide operating procedures. Um, so no, blowdowns are no longer our top category of methane emissions. So we, we actually are pretty, pretty proud to see how, how much that's gone down. And so then that kind of puts you on that, that cost curve of now what's the next category that we go after. So it's been, been a pretty interesting uh, um, journey through that. And so that's not to diminish the concept of, you know, we were just talking about leaks, but at the end of the day, those known vented emissions are really, you know, that's the most controllable and easy to, to address from a day-to-day -day perspective. And then on top of that, we're putting in place all the advanced leak detection to try to find those super emitters and fix them quickly. Thank you. All right. Are there efforts to go above and beyond just regulatory requirements here, particularly with um, mitigating vented emissions? Has anybody heard about new 
efforts being undertaken? Yeah, I can <clears throat> address that. I think it's, it's, it's know your system and know your risks. You know, if you've got areas where you've got, you know, subsidence, you've got areas um, where you're earthquake prone, you've got situations where you've got legacy plastics or older type of pipe, the idea is for the operator to understand their system, understand their pipe and some of the risk associated with their pipe. And rather than a prescriptive regulation, if they have to go out and survey that more frequently, because it is leak prone and risk prone, um, that's where I think more advanced leak detection technology is being involved where, where utilities will go and our operators will go out there and, and leak survey their systems more frequently than it actually is what required by regulation. Um, because they know um, there are potential risks for that until that pipe can, can ultimately be replaced. It could be frost, it could, there's a number of different issues out there environmentally. All right. Um, I'm curious, uh, we know that California has required blowdown mitigation for a few years. Do we know how this is going? Is it keeping methane in the pipe? And has it been cost effective? I can speak a little bit. Um, EDF has been engaged for some years with the, the implementation of SB 1371 in California, which required um, distribution companies and, and pipeline operators to implement a number of practices to mit mitigate methane emissions from their systems. And I don't have all my stats in front of me or at the forefront of my head, so we'll not even attempt to provide any numbers. Um, but, you know, in general, what we've seen is some really sort of creative and innovative thinking um, from gas utilities in California. The, the way uh, some of the programs under SB 1371 were structured and the way that the California Public Utilities Commission approached that um, was to develop um, a number of best practices um, and then to allow the utilities, you know, some amount of leeway in the way that they implemented and achieved those best practices. And so what we found really interesting is that the annual reports um, filed by each utility about their methane abatement programs really provide just amazing detail, you know, about the types of work practices and technologies that they're implementing and, you know, really good numeric reporting on the methane mitigation that they're achieving. And I think that's, you know, a great model that we hope to see replicated elsewhere. Um, and I will say as a lawyer and not an engineer, I really enjoyed uh, attempting to read some of the individual work practice documents and, <laughs> and really understand sort of how things are being implemented um, on the ground, but, but think it's a great sort of source of progress and again, hopefully it sort of serves as a helpful model for operators in other states as well. Thank you. I understand the struggle, loyal <laughs> lawyer brain. <laughs> Um, all right. Is what about FEMSA? Are you guys going to issue a rulemaking on 114? Do you guys think your advisory opinion um, covers this? How have inspections been going for uh, the plans for remediation and replacement? Um, I could start with the inspections first. Overall, um, they appear to be fairly positive. Um, Linda seems like a nice person, but I can say you she's been really <laughs> on the regions to make sure we get our inspections completed by the end of this year. Uh, states are in a fairly good pros uh, progress, except for, um, and I, I think it's fair to say even in even some of our regions, but also states, the master meters, there's a ton of them out there. Some of these uh, operators don't even know they're regulated by FEMSA, let alone what is this Section 114 okay. thing. So there's some engagement pieces there we're working on. Um, so it might be a chance some master meters will go into next year. Um, the best available technologies report, um, we are working on completing that as soon as possible. Um, I can't say what's in it yet either because that's still internal review, but I think it's fair to say we will um, probably be showing a lot of information of what's already in the EPA, uh, Natural Gas Stark Program, and some of the others. As far as rulemakings, uh, we believe, at least right now, you know, at least some of the five that we have in play, like the rupture detection helps a lot, some of the others. Um, we will certainly consider doing a rulemaking um, if it falls into the priority lists. Um, uh, if it's reasonable, things like that. So, um, you know, based on the outcomes of the report, uh, seeing how these other rulemakings go, we might have something else. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about the complexities of having a rulemaking uh, tied to specific best available technologies gets a little complicated. So we'll have to look at some of those angles as well. Um, but I think overall it's going, I think going well, um, that, at least from what I've seen in talking to some of our inspectors. 
Um, a little plug, uh, we also have a public uh, meeting in Houston in a couple weeks where we war we'll talk about um, some lessons learned, things like that. So you might hear directly from our inspectors on some of that Greg Oaks in the central region will helping uh, to lead that as well. So, and that will, I believe, be webcast. Yes, so we'll be webcast. Apologies on our behalf. We ideally would have liked to send these notices much sooner, but um, if anyone doesn't know, it takes a long time even to get federal register notices approved. So um, it will be webcast, though, so people can't make it to use it in person. It will be webcast. So, and that is a public meeting uh, open to all. So, yep. Great. Um, I want to ask the panelists if there's anything that I didn't ask them that they want to answer before I open it up to the Q&A from the audience. Erin? Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> uh, just an unsolicited comment on Section 114, um, and no, no judgment on FIMSA or on Congress, just an observation. But, you know, I think as we're talking about, like, 113 and 114 kind of in conjunction, I want to maybe remind us, you know, Erin mentioned earlier that Section 114 came into effect, right, at, at the beginning of 2022, but... Um, you know, what What actually came into an effect was a requirement for operators to update their O&M plans, um, operations and maintenance plans, to incorporate measures to reduce methane emissions. But those plans are not filed. They're not available to the public. Um, and FIMSA inspectors have been doing inspections and reviewing those plans over the course of this year. Um, but I, I just say that I think it's a you know contrast to draw with like what I was just describing in California, where I'm reading these annual reports being filed by utilities and, and reading exactly what practices they're implementing and their numeric estimates of, of the methane emissions that they've decreased through the technologies and practices they're implementing. Section 114 isn't that, right? It's a good step forward because I think it starts to normalize sort of thinking about reducing methane emissions from an environment as well as a safety perspective. But, you know, that first step of it is is really kind of preliminary. And I think, you know, the steps to come, I'm excited to hear Max mention um, that FIMSA has a report that's going to be sort of summarizing what's come out of it, because I think that's going to be really valuable and sort of brings me to emphasizing sort of why I think the Section 113 nationwide advanced leak detection rulemaking is going to be so important. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, and yeah. I'll just add, I agree with what Aaron said, um, still as a paradigm shift, emissions is not necessarily leak detection, because even this uh, Section 114 emissions report, people thought, oh, that's another leak detection report. No, it's not. It's something different. Leak detection does have a part in emissions, but it is reducing emissions. So yeah, I agree completely. That's uh, kind of two different dynamics. Great. We have questions from the audience. There is a mic, so I'd like somebody to bring one to any of these lovely participants. Raise your hands high and smile. <laughs> Hi, Virginia Palacios with Commission Shift. Um, Mark, I just had a question. I, it, the story about blowdowns is really interesting. It sounds like a success. It, was it cost neutral or cost positive? Um, you know, what's the threshold at which you know that this is going to be beneficial from a um, cost perspective? Yeah, nothing's cost positive in this world. <laughs> um, so you know, historically, the way we manage this, it's it's not new to you know reduce pressure before a blowdown. That's common practice. But historically, we had used the price of gas as the break-even point. Um, and what we changed was, I think we were using the worked out to be like ten dollars a ton of CO two, um, and that demonstrated very. I mean. In the grand scheme of things, from uh, the cost curve of reducing emissions, $10 a ton is pretty reasonable. Um, and I think if you were to look at a price of gas, it, if gas is $5, it probably comes out to, you know, 4 to $6 range, uh, dollars per uh, metric ton of CO2. So it, we were going at a high, slightly higher cost. But at the end of the day, what we really found was um, when you plan ahead, and a lot of times if a the schedule on a blowdown, you know, it takes time to, to recompress and draw down pressure. And what we really, when we did incident investigations on why did we have, you know, these, these four blowdowns at line pressure, it usually was a failure of communication internally and, and bad planning. So somehow, way or another, we wound up with operations requirement or commercial requirement to get the uh, line back up in service. Uh, and so by driving that communication, it really wasn't much of a cost to take that on. Um, it's more just that pushing that planning. So, Thanks for your question, Virginia. Um, 
No. You're next. Or no. <laughs> when you uh, ask your question, if you could introduce your name and who you're associated with, that would be great for the people online. We're getting a mic. Hello. Got it. He's got, he's Hi. My name is Robert Miller. I'm currently with Everline LLC out of Houston, and I'm a recovering regulator from the state of Arizona. <laughs> uh, my question is the bullet number three where it applies to the entire 2.8 million miles. I don't see there where L, uh, liquefied petroleum gas, is that included in this 2.8 million? Because I see it's not listed as LNG is separately. Uh, so our current inspection approach uh, for 114, if it's a natural gas, and Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's a natural gas facility that um, helps feed a, a liquid a facility as well, then that's considered part of our inspections. Um, I will say we are looking at the next stage of do we need to look at in the entire pipeline system. That gets really interesting and complicated, and I'm sure industry will have some comments on that, or whether we can go there. But um, that's at least the current approach now. So in a way, yes, it applies to the entire system, but it, it depends. Hello, uh, my name is Scott Eustis. Um, I'm a Healthy Golf. Uh, we're a 26-year-old environmental nonprofit from Texas to Florida. And uh, my question was, is there any uh, planning anticipated in the need for more labor after hurricanes? I ask because you know, I'm not trained in leak detection, but if we, f we flew after Ida, for example, just a couple of Cessna flights and filed 20 NRC reports of oil on water from different infrastructure in the coastal zone. Uh, Sempra, Cameron, LNG, you know, their 2020 benzene emissions, one third of those were unplanned. And I, I imagine that was due to Hurricane Laura, uh, which hit them pretty hard. So we, you know, what we see is the Coast Guard has ramped up, but they're still a bit overwhelmed. Our state agencies don't, and often, you know, they don't have boats in an area where we have a lot of these pipelines underwater. So is there any thought of like working with Coast Guard or say civilian air patrol that has a lot of, you know, airplane capacity after disasters to speed up the, uh, the rate of inspection after predictable geohazards. I can't specifically speak on the liquid side, but I, I can on the natural gas side is, is there is uh, mutual agreements. I know the American Gas Association, several of the trade associations have mutual agreements. So if there are catastrophic incidents like that, <clears throat> the various utilities or operators will supply people to leave their facilities and, and drive to wherever the affected area is with technology, um, with vehicles, you know, with portable equipment. You gotta remember these people are operator qualified too, so you, you just can't take a non-operator qualified person and put them out doing some of these inspections. So through some of this mutual assistance um, that has worked extremely well um, through some of these major catastrophic incidents, they can deploy. You just saw what happened in Florida, um, just with the electric and power companies and stuff that you know that that you know uh, relocated in a very short period of time. And so um, that that works works well. I mean, you can't be every inch of pipe, um, you know, as quick as you'd like to, but you, we certainly can get the resources and the equipment into those areas. A lot of it has to do with, and even on the natural gas side, you know, when houses get disrupted off their foundations because of earth and pipes are broken, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of the debris fields and stuff. And so there's a lot of advanced leak detection with standoff laser technology, with advanced mobile vehicles that are more sensitive that can pick up some of these leak indications, you know, and so there, a lot of those are driven, you know, in these hurricane affected areas to get in there quickly. You know, utility can't shut off the get, you know, the gas in those areas. If they depressurize that gas, then all the lines fill up with water, um, you know, from the tidal surge and stuff. And now we got even a bigger problem, you know, and so that's why the key is to get out there quickly and find these, these situations and cap, cap these off, um, these large leaks. Hi everyone, uh, Joe Nye, I'm with the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at the White House, uh, and I'm the FIMSA desk officer, so I just, full disclosure, but I wanted to ask a question about uh, <laughs> uh, the what we know about the baseline right now, specifically about like 
both leak detection and emissions detection systems that are in use by uh, the industry, how much variability is there in the types of systems that are used, how, what percent saturation are we seeing across the industry, is there one system being predominantly used, are there multiple, and, uh, and sort of how, how are you all keeping track of that? <laughs> Thank you. So I'm here for. Uh, I, I honestly don't know if we have the data collected on that. Um, I know our folks, um, Office of Planning Analytics, they look at um, the economic impacts of or uh, approaches the markets on, on some of these as well. I, I will also say we're often limited to in getting too much into details of some of the specific technologies because it does get into antitrust concerns and things like that. Um, as an overall market trend, I don't know if I have honestly those specific uh, questions right now, but feel free to uh, reach out to us and we'll get with our OPA folks and some of the others. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll add a little to it after I pointed the question to you. Um, I, w I feel like I wear a lot of hats these days. One, one of them is uh, working with National Petroleum Council. So the NPC is currently doing a study that is covering the greenhouse gas emissions across the entire natural gas value chain. Part of that, I think the first section of that is baseline. What's the current technologies being used? What are the policies in place? What trajectory does that put the overall greenhouse gas emissions footprint on? And then taking that all the way through kind of where, you know, where are we going? Um, what, what additional technology needs are there? And um, I'm sure a whole host of other things. So that uh, will be my extracurricular activity for the next uh, 12 months or so. Yeah. And I'll just add to one, as, as I thought about it too, I know we are getting creative or trying to get creative on cost benefit analyses. So there have been some executives orders out there, for instance, looking at the social cost of carbon and things like that. So um, that alone could get really interesting um, with some of these rules. Um, we anticipate there will probably be some disagreements on some of the numbers, but hey, it's cost benefit. We always have disagreements on the, or not disagreements, uh, creative uh, discussions <laughs> on those. So um, things like that are coming up too. And again, this is uh, a, a a full administration perspective on agencies working together to see how we collectively address some of these issues. So those are things like that that are coming up is what's the social cost of carbon, which gets really interesting. So, yep. And I'll add, Paul and I were discussing the, a, a couple aspects of this, but one is that advanced leak detection is seeing greater and greater market saturation in a variety of ways. Uh, it comes in a couple of ways. One, um, companies can purchase the devices, and that becomes a capital asset, which they're, they're able to pay for. And that's becoming more common. Second, uh, there are a number of device operators, uh, 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 sources that are coming online, and it seems like there's another one or two every year, which reflects both the growth of the market and its uh, increasing depth of saturation. Um, Colorado State University operates METEC, which is the methane, methane emissions testing um, facility uh, where a number of technology providers come to test uh, and demonstrate the effectiveness of their technologies, creating that sort of nutrition label information I was talking about earlier. Um, and uh, uh, the Gas Technology Institute, among other places, provides that. Uh, there are a number of ways that we might be able to try to get you some of the information about saturation if you'd like more about that. Yeah, and, and most operators today have training facilities or what they call, you know, leak, leak fields where they simulate, they can create leaks to, to train their own people on to uh, operate, qualify their people. Instead of going out in the field and do it, they just simulate, create live leaks within systems. And, and most of all the leak detecting technology, uh, just because ABC companies using it and ABC likes it doesn't mean every other operator, you know, feels the same way. And so each operator tends to scrutinize each piece of equipment before it's approved through their engineering team to come into their facility. They take it out on these and, and it's basically show us it, show us and let's go out and, and you know, I've got a number of leaks out here of different sizes and I want you to go find them. And so there's double blind studies and stuff to prove it out. Even though you may have white paper after white paper of all these studies, most operators still want to go out and see it themselves within their own system. So, Thank you. I think I'm getting a signal that there's a question in the back. Uh, yes, uh, Dante okay. Swinton, uh, Center for International Environmental Law. Uh, Mark, I believe you mentioned uh, that you had a climate goal, and I was hoping you could repeat that in terms of the amount of uh, reductions and the percentage compared to whatever baseline level uh, you, you were talking about earlier. But also, since you're part of the NPC, I'm curious to hear if there are either 
weaker, as aggressive, or more aggressive climate goals uh, that these companies have in terms of reducing their methane emissions as well as their CO2 emissions. And if you could shed some light on that. Yep, sure thing. Uh, our commitment is a 56% reduction from our 2005 baseline, um, and we hope to achieve that by 2030 or, or sooner. Um, it's an absolute goal, and I think uh, what we're seeing pretty often across industry is a lot of uh, uh, intensity-based goals. So as companies, we're you know, in, the, in the business of growing our business, growing throughputs, um, increasing capacity. So a lot of people have used uh, intensity-based metrics, you know, it's similar to One Future, which is our nation's energy future, uh, which was set up on a, on a methane intensity goal across everything from the wellhead to the burner tip, um, trying to achieve a 1% or less goal. Um, so I think uh, there's goals all over the place, um, but I think uh, what we're seeing is a lot of uh, 2030 type timeframes to 2050, and then baselines are starting to kind of move up some. and. I guess one thing a lot of companies are looking at is keeping the baseline to be something meaningful to continuously pushing for further reductions. Thank you so much. I've been told that we need to end our session, but I want to thank our panelists for joining us. And I want to thank everybody for attending the session today. Thank you so much. <laughs>